All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Honest Defense Podcast. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Michelle Druin. Michelle is a professor of psychology at Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne. She has served as a forensic consultant, expert witness. She's an internationally recognized researcher and speaker. Uh, Dr. Druin focuses her work on issues related to technology, relationships, couples, and sexuality. She's also the author of the upcoming book, Out of Touch, How to Survive an Intimacy Famine. That will be out February 1st, but I was able to read an early copy of it. And I was just telling Michelle before that the book was a cathartic experience for me. I'm so excited to be able to, to talk about it. Uh, Michelle, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I first want to say that this book is coming out at uh, a fortunate or unfortunate time, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you know, Everyone's having to learn terms like social distancing and all of that. You've been working on these issues really your whole career. Can you tell me what was the timeline for the book? Were you planning this before COVID happened? And, and how's it a great one. That's a great question. No one's asked me this yet, but you're actually happening upon a really cool part of the story. So when the world shut down pretty immediately, as it did in the United States, was around March. And an editor from MIT Press reached out to me. At the time, we had been pretty strictly in lockdown, unlike I think what transpired for the rest of the pandemic. And so I was home, I was alone, the world kind of stopped. And so what I say is I was at a vulnerable moment where he said, what about staying home and writing a book? And I was like, yeah, I'm home anyway. <laughs> so he had reached out to me before, but there was something about the timing that was perfect for me. It was actually you used the word cathartic. I found writing to be quite a cathartic process for me during the pandemic. It allowed me to take some of the feelings I was having and translate them into a I guess, general vocal voice that other people could relate to. Um, so he got me at a really, really good time. And so although most, much of the work that I referenced was done prior to the pandemic, that the pandemic really did spur me saying yes to the book. And then it was actually, I signed a contract with MIT Press uh, that fall and they ha it gave me until December of this year to get it done. But I set a goal for myself that I was going to write it by the end of last year year. I did it. I'm at the goal. And um, the silence that existed around us as I was in quarantine actually helped move me forward. I bet. And so one of the early experiments that you write about in the book, it kind of, it encapsulates really the full irrationality, I think, of, of human relationships. You write about how there was this experiment you did where you took couples and you talked them individually and you asked each of them individually uh, about kind of their sex life and whether they wanted to have more sex. And, and both of them would say, yes, I want to have more sex. And it seems like, you know, you, the rest of the book, you talk about these big global issues. A lot of the guests I have on the podcast talk about these big global issues. But when you have such a fundamental breakdown just between two people and a couple who both want the same thing, but it's not happening, you know, how do you, that, that seems like, well, we need to start at that fundamental building block right there is, is communication between couples. Can you explain what is that breakdown and how does that kind of affect all these bigger issues that you talk about? Well, actually, there are, two, there are two studies that I talk about in the book. The first study was actually conducted by someone else. They, they had people have more sex, and that actually didn't work out well because what happened, I think, and what the authors propose happened is that because they were forced to do something, they had a psychological reaction to that. We don't like being told what to do, and being told what to do is not fun. So over the course of that experiment where couples were simply told, have more sex, that didn't work out. So what I propose is a different way to study that, a different way that accounts for both people's wants in a relationship. So instead of just saying, hey, let's recruit in couples, by the way, these couples were happy anyway. They were having what I would say is probably a normal amount of sex anyway, but let's recruit in couples who are unhappy, who maybe have a desired discrepancy. So it doesn't matter. Some couples are happy with sex five times a week. Some couples are happy with sex five times a year. But as long as you're on the same page as your partner, it, it probably isn't creating much of an issue in your relationship. But if we get people who have a desire discrepancy and we get them to negotiate, then we can maybe see something different. Maybe then that negotiation will propel their relationship forward in some way. Um, there is a real critical breakdown though. And I think this is the important part of what you're focusing on. There's a critical breakdown in couples often between what they want in a relationship and what they're getting in that relationship, whether it's intimacy issues, communication issues, and those are probably two of the big ones, um, or you know the way that they spend money, what their values are, how they're raising their children. 
a lot of people, instead of addressing those issues head on, will just avoid, avoid, avoid. And to say that that's the reason why we have such a high divorce rate, I don't think is unrealistic, right? It's hard to make a relationship work when you're putting together two people with different drives, motivations, experiences. So um, oftentimes what you see down see in the breakdown of a marriage is a critical breakdown in the communication in that marriage. And is that kind of a new trend? Is that something you ascribe to technology or is that has that always been men are from Mars, women are from, from Venus kind of thing? I don't even think it's men and women. I just think it's any two people, you know, take two men, two women in a relationship. You you have breakdowns even in friendships, right? Where communication doesn't go well. So I think that this is to think that you could marry two lives without any kind of issues, you know, coming up is, is unrealistic. There will be issues that come up in relationships because you're not putting together two people who feel exactly the same about everything. And that's good because I think that we are enriched greatly by our experiences with others and by the compromises we have to make by having to blend our lives with someone else. We are, none of us are perfect. So when we get together, we bring in those imperfections and we try to make them mix. So I think it's an age old issue, not exacerbated by anything technology wise, but there are things that we're doing with technology that might make those issues better or worse. Right. And when you talk about, you know, especially like with people on their phones and how, when you're looking at your phone, when you're in front of someone else, whether it's, it's a, a, a romantic relationship or a friendship or anything, and someone sees you on your phone, instead of talking to them, there's that inherent feeling that you get like, oh, whatever's on your phone is more interesting than me. And you even write about how you know a divorce attorney who is putting in these rules into prenups about use of technology and use of phones. Is that the solution? Because it almost feels like when you have to start writing down these rules, now it's you've got to start policing each other. That just doesn't, that seems kind of inherently like, well, now you're you're destroying some part of the relationship that should should be more uh, implicit, I guess. Or natural, like right. it should be our natural inclination not to look at our phone. Here's the thing. Our phones are attractive to us. They've made them wonderfully attractive for a reason, because it makes us buy them more, right? So I think that all of that is fine. Everything that they're doing to make our phones attractive to us, good. That's that's their right. And and we are we by demanding more are increasing the supply of these phones that have really attractive features for human beings. They are our key to our social world. So it's our natural inclination to answer social overtures, whether that be from a person who's right next to us or from our phone, which the social overtures coming from our phone could be from other people who are meaningful in our lives. So when I am looking at my phone and responding to my sister, I am doing something that's natural and good for my relationship with my sister. But at the same time, I might be sacrificing the relationship I have with my husband if he's sitting right there doing it. So, I mean, let's get to your bigger point. Should this be something that people write down? Yeah, why not? Well, it at least should be a discussion. Because if you were in a relationship, Eric, you might feel, I don't care when my spouse is on their phone or my partner is on their phone. If we're sitting and watching television and they're out scrolling through Instagram, no problem. That's no problem for me. I'd like to do the same, whatever. But then there are other people who would feel really rejected by that and feel like their partner is not being fully present. So at least having the discussion is something valuable. And I'm not proposing that people police each other. What I'm proposing is that you guys mutually agree on this is our rule as a couple. And then if someone digresses from that rule as a couple, then you have a conversation about it, right? And if you have it in something like a prenup, it just makes that formalized, right? Like these are the things that we are not going to tolerate in our relationship. And there are, you probably know all kinds of things in a prenup. So if you're not going to tolerate infidelity, if you're not going to tolerate, um, you know, some of the other things that people put in prenups, so why not put rules about social media or phone use in there? It makes sense to me. And it, what I think it is critically is starting a discussion. Right. It's, it's getting everything out there. I always joke, yeah. I, I come from an Italian family. It's a very stereotypical Italian family. We're very emotional. We tell people what we're thinking, especially people in our family. We don't hold anything in. And so from, from, from an outside perspective, it might seem like, oh, you guys are just always yelling at each other. But, but really, that's just how we express ourselves. And because of that, 
there's not really a lot of pent up resentment. There's nothing you, you hold in that you hate someone for for years. It's you kind of just get it all out there on the surface to begin with. And everyone kind of knows where they stand very early on. Well, my family isn't Italian, but we do the same thing. <laughs> I feel like our families would get along real well, yeah, yeah. which is something different. You know, my husband's family, they're not like that. They, you know, they really do hold things in. They don't, they don't have a lot of outward conflict, but the way I feel is, Hey, if I get that conflict out, we can resolve it and move on. Um, but yes, yeah, some families are not like that. So we all bring to the table, different experiences regarding our families, our upbringing. So Anything that you can discuss prior to starting your partnership is good because the worst thing, Eric, would be you are now in a relationship with someone and every day they're using their phone while they're scrolling through Instagram while you guys are watching TV and you don't say anything because that's not what your family taught you to do. And then you're just building and building and building resentment. And then eventually there's a crack and all of those things that you've been building resentment about, including them scrolling through Instagram, then suddenly come up. Like that would be a worst case scenario than, than them discussing it at the front. Right. So you talk a lot about social media in the book, and this is kind of where the cathartic stuff comes in because a lot of what you write about is stuff that I think would seem intuitive to people, but you put it into scientific terms that kind of kind of validate, I think, what a lot of people feel naturally. So you, you say that you know those who report the highest rates of social media use also felt the most socially isolated. And and in the inverse, the people who use social media the least actually were the most socially comfortable, I guess, is is the inverse of that. But is is that just a fundamental flaw of social media? Because the idea of of social media when it started was, oh, this is a great way to connect the world and make people feel like they're a part of something. Is is that just an inherent flaw in social media or is there a balance that needs to be achieved? Maybe just be somewhere in the middle. Well, first let me caution with the caveat that correlation does not equal causation, right? So the people who are the loneliest, maybe they went to social media to find connection that they weren't getting in their offline lives. Okay. And they might've still been the loneliest and it might be that their loneliness is actually better than what it would be if they didn't have social media, right? Like right. maybe they're saying they're at a three, these bottom 25% and it, without social media, maybe they'd be at a zero or a one. So we don't know that. So is there anything inherently problematic? I don't think so. I mean, one of the things that I think I want to say in the book, which is my unique stance, I believe, in terms of what is out there, is that we do not have to view this technology as something bad. It's not bad. It is answering a lot of our social wants, clearly, dilemmas that we might have. It helps us keep contact with people who are our closest connections and even some who are not, but that could be, right? So I feel that it's a great tool to access the social world. However, what happens, I think, is some people fall into a trap where they are using that at the expense of developing other types of interactions and relationships. And when your life is 100% ingrained in a, an online world, you might be missing a few things that are important to your development, to your you know, relationship evolution that you probably should start attending to. Right. And you said that in your, your TED Talk. You gave a great TED Talk a couple of years ago. That's how I first found your work. And you can find it on YouTube. I recommend that for everyone. And you mm -hmm. said, thanks to you know social media and these apps, that you have access to everyone you've ever been attracted to your whole life. And okay. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, I did I, I wrote that, wrote that down because that, 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 that stuck out to me because I, I took issue not with, no. others, with, with maybe just kind of the implication of that because I don't think it's that you have access to them is that you think you have access, you feel like you have access to them. So in some ways, I think it's what you were just saying, where it's, uh, you can use social media to feel like a replacement for real social connection. And is that where the problem comes in that you, you see people's faces pop up and, and it feels like they're right there when, when really they're not. Interesting. So, you know, access Let's say even, unless you're blocked by someone entirely, you still have access to get a window to their life. And even if those communication mechanisms are not open to you, you're not DMing them. Access, I think, because of the internet means that as soon as you have anything that's at all public, 
it is really hard to hide yourself. Like right now, I could, it would be impossible for me to hide. It, it'd be impossible because there's n- my name, my image, my, you know, these podcasts that I do, they're out there. And even if I got them all erased, anyone could have duplicated it and put them back out. Right. So, um, in, in, terms of access, I really do think people do have access to everyone. Okay. Access, but you, you have a valid point because it's, although you have access in some ways in terms of being able to see someone's life, that does not mean that you have access in order to communicate with them directly. It doesn't mean that they're going to reciprocate any of your communication, any of your feelings, any of your uh, commitment to that kind of relationship. So on that part, you're completely right. So although the internet gives you an idea that you can actually touch pretty much anyone, it is creating kind of a false sense of whether or not those people are accessible. Right. And so is that the key is kind of just understanding that and separating the social media world from the real world? Because- and again, this, the idea that you, know, you say that the phone fulfills our need for for intimacy, it, it kind of fills a little bit of a hole that we have. Is that is that just because the, the technology is playing this psychological game on our mind, or is it actually fulfilling that hole? Because I, I think back to, I read this book by uh, Sebastian Younger called Tribe, and he had this great story in there about, I think it was really a whole chapter about how there are all these accounts of the western frontier you know in the 1700s 1800s and mm-hmm. and native tribes capturing frontiersmen or or frontiersmen running away from from their town and, and escaping to these tribes and and actually wanting to stay with the tribes these if you know to the frontiersmen it was these savage tribes that were so uncouth and and uncivilized but there was something about the connection that they felt with these tribes because maybe because the life was so simple living like that as opposed to mm-hmm. these frontiersmen who, who had a more complicated life and were, were trying to establish these, these complex civilizations. Is there something about the complexity of social media that's driving us crazy that we need to detach from? I'm you asking know, you a lot of questions right in there. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to okay. trying to figure out exactly what I want to answer. So your mention of the word tribe is really great and super relevant. One of the complexities of the internet that I think holds a lot of beauty is the fact that you can more easily find your tribe on the internet than you can in face-to-face life for most things, right? So if I have particular interests that are hard to reach or or hard to find, if I have tastes or romantic interests that are unique or niche, it will be much easier for me to find those than it will as I walk through my daily world, which tends to be quite routine. I see pretty much the same people. So for diversity sake, I think the internet is a cornucopia of opportunity. And especially for people who, like I say, people who are in niche groups or who have niche interests, it allows you to make real connections with those people. So finding your tribe, I think, is probably easier. One of the problems is, though, that there's so many people. So this, again, brings your complexity issue to the forefront again. There's so many people that you then have to choose. Okay, do I join the group of people who like, um, you know, the same things I like and they're on this continent and then they meet for coffee every Wednesday over virtual uh, some kind of video chat? Or do I meet with this group? But the point is it kind of doesn't matter. You could find someone. And being able to find someone is something that I think we take for granted. You seem like a pretty socially adept person. You reached out to me. You're obviously confident you have the ability to navigate social relationships in a way that helps you move through this world. Okay, you say kind of. Nonetheless, I will say that I think you... You know, not everyone convinces me to come on a podcast and you actually tried a couple of times and I thought you were, you're very good in your approach. But not everyone has that, right? And not everyone has the social network in offline life that makes them feel fulfilled. So the internet with all of its complexities, I think gives a lot of opportunity to people who may not have as rich of a network outside or may not have the social skills that maybe you might have to arrange face-to-face meetings or whatever. It has something for everyone. It really, really does. So that's what's encouraging to me, right? 
I, I feel very lucky. I have friends. I have lots of connections and I feel very supported by them, loved by them. But not everyone feels like that, right? So the fact that the internet offers people a chance at the thing that I really value most, I can't malign it. Yeah. And it's true. And it's, I've found myself, I've been in a new city for the last two years and I find myself using social media more being in a new city because it is, especially obviously the last two years, it's kind of the only way to find people and meet people. And it has, that's how I've gotten a lot of guests on this podcast is through social media. So I, I certainly have mixed emotions about the benefits and the drawbacks of it. So I, I think you're right. It's that, again, you have to, with any technology, there's good and there's bad and you have to kind of accept that you've got a double-edged sword and just try to maximize the good and minimize the, the bad. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say it's mostly good. I don't, I don't even think I'm going out on a limb on that. Like when I think about what I'm able to do in this world, this book would not exist if I hadn't done a Ted talk that was recorded and put on the internet for hundreds of thousands of people to view. And then MIT press, someone in London looked at that video and said, she has something to say. And then th me being able to say this, what if this touches someone in a way that sets them on a trajectory that makes them feel good about their life? I, it, the point is, all of us, I think, take for granted the things that the internet and social media allow us to do every single day. It allows me to collaborate with people around the world. It allows me to change science. You know, I am making science. I am uh, collaborating with people sometimes when I'm on a plane flying to Japan and I'm sending emails back and forth with one of my collaborators who lives in England. Like it's, it is beautiful what I can do now. So I'm going to say it's mostly good. And the things that are pitfalls for us are because we have a natural tendency to just want and want and want and want, right? So, you know, when I have a bowl of cereal in the morning, I always want two. It's hard for me to say no to two bowls of cereal because once I start eating, I'm like, ooh, this is good. I want another bowl of cereal. I want another piece of chocolate cake. I'm, I really loved it for me. I, and once I get something, I want more something I like that I want more. And I think that's the problem with tech, right? Is that we like it and therefore we want more. So um, to me, that would be the, the negative issue. And our ability to also filter out the things that are bad for us and filter in the things that are good for us, uplifting, help us grow as human beings. I think that I know putting individual responsibility on it is a little tough, especially since we have a whole generation of digital natives who are having to make these decisions about what do I filter out and filter in without a lot of guidance and with, you know, the advertisements really being geared towards things that can sometimes be unhealthy. So that's, it's unfair to say it's an individual responsibility only, but for those of us who are adults, we have a lot of responsibility about what we consume. Right. And one of the, I think the big positives of social media lately is the trend. You talk about how social media and this idea of persistence, that the communication we put out tends to last as opposed to just verbal communication or, or over the phone. But with things like Instagram stories and Snapchat, you're kind of seeing these developments where you have social media that doesn't last forever. And I think that's so much healthier, especially for younger people. I mean, you think you know, if you're 14, 15, and you're sending out tweets and to think that those things, and, and there's plenty of stories of this, these tweets coming back to haunt people 10 years later from when they were in high school, which is, it seems like such a, a miserable way to, to have a society. So that to me is one of the big positive developments is that there is this popularity of social media that, that you can put out there and then it disappears. I agree. I agree. You know, my, my kids wanted social media for a long time. And what I told them, you know, the COMPA Act protects children under the age of 13 from having uh, their information online. And because of that, it's not surprising that the social media giants require a 13 year old age requirement because then they're aligning themselves with the COMPA Act. So what I said to my kids very young is you will not have social media until you're 13. And the reason why is because you are the only group of people who are protected from having your information displayed on the internet. And I want you to hold that protection as long as you can, because once you sign up for social media, you revoke that protection, whether you're four, eight, 11, you're, you're done. That's it. So I made the idea of protecting your identity important. Now I have a son who's heading into 14 
and he doesn't really post anything. And I'm really happy about that because what I've said to him very early on, like a lot of kids, he wanted to be a YouTube star, you know, so he wanted to, you know, post pictures of him doing backflips. I mean, and I was like, you are so great. He'd be like, video me doing this backflip. I'm like, you, at 10 years old, he could do a standing backflip. Amazing. That's amazing. I want you to feel amazing about that, but I don't want you to get tied into how many other people like that. I like it. You feel great. You learned it. You master it. Let that be enough. And more importantly, what I said to him regarding what you're talking about, this persistence is the type of thing that you would post when you're 11 might be very different than what you would post when you're 21 and different again than what you post when you're 41. And you need to recognize that who you are is going to change a lot. So the things that you think are appropriate now, you might think are highly inappropriate then. So always take the more conservative step. If it's post or not post, not post is always the right answer. Um, And I feel like my kids are pretty convinced of that. So, you know, I have one who's going to be 12 and he really doesn't even use a phone at all, uh, except as an emergency thing. Um, and then my other son, he, he uses kind of those, uh, destroy after reading apps to communicate with his friends, things like Snapchat. Um, but he even knows the perils of those, but I agree having those apps with those built-in features that will make your posts disappear or your, what you're writing disappear is good because kids will make mistakes. Adults will make mistakes. We'll all make mistakes. Right. And something I really I'm sad about right now that I don't really delve into a lot in the book is just the fact that we live in a cancel culture. Like I, it's really hard for me. Forgiveness is a huge value of mine. I think people should be able to forgive, move on, let their mistakes be forgotten. And I know one of my favorite TED talks is Monica Lewinsky's, I think it's the price of shame or a cost of shame. And she talks about making this very big you know, being a part of a very big issue in a time when social media and the media was just now putting attention and spotlighting people's big missteps. And it was super traumatic. So cancel culture, I I, I just, I can't wait until it's over. I can't wait until we're now in a forgiving culture. Right. Well, growing up, you know, in the '90s, early 2000s, every movie it felt like was about someone reinventing themselves. You know, they they made a mistake or, or they they chose a life path that they realized was wrong, and they were able to just start over. You kind of always had that image growing up of like, okay, I can always just start over if I need to. Are you thinking of a movie in particular? I uh, want to see one movie. Uh, can you think I, of one where that happened? I mean, I, like even just not another teen movie, like these movies making fun of other movies. <laughs> not another to... teen movie. <laughs> I love that that's the one that you thought of. Because <laughs> that, that, that was, when it was it was an amalgamation of, of 15 other movies that were about the same theme, which is just okay. like, being able to reinvent themselves. Yeah, I mm-hmm. probably should. I'm sure I should have thought of a, a more intellectual answer than that. One. I love it. It's, I, I, I love it because way. it's just honest. You didn't have time to rehearse it. <laughs> you know, not another teen movie. It's so perfect. That Oscar winner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, like I'd, I'd love to see some kind of formal study on that. Like, is it, I'm sure it's harder for kids or anyone to reinvent themselves these days because you have this paper trail now of who you were forever. And and I, I'm completely with you that forgiveness and giving someone a second chance is that's vital to the human <clears throat> experience because we all screw up. And yeah. I, I feel like people are less willing now to even take risks or take chances because of that because they're afraid of screwing up and that living on forever. And how does that affect? And there there's so many dominoes that fall with that. How does that affect entrepreneurship and and creativity and art because people don't want to take chances. Okay. So this will be a big share. I think in my book, I talk a little bit about big shares. So big shares are just, you know, the gravity of how big it is to you, not necessarily how big it is to the world. But I will say to you that writing this book was that for me, because I realized I was opening myself up to the world. And I actually held the paperback cover of it for the first time a week ago. And I held it in my hands and I was so excited. And then I looked at my husband and I said, "Uh uh-oh. I didn't think that I would have that feeling, but that's the way I felt was, uh uh-oh. And I thought, what have I opened myself up to, right? Because you know, you've read the book. It's not just science. And even if I did write about just science, there are ways to attack even my just science, right? Um, But I have personal anecdotes in there. I talk about my own life. I talk about people who I love. I talk about my friends um, who I disguise, of course, their names, but um, it, it feels very vulnerable. So 
I hired a book publicist for this book um, who will be working, she's working in conjunction with my MIT Press publicist and the marketing team at both MIT Press and Penguin Random House who distributes the book. And one of the things I was doing when I was looking for a book publicist was really just seeing who they were. And ultimately, um, when I chose this book publicist, I said, Angela, I we just want you to know that one of the things I'm worried most about is I have a happy life. I'm a really happy person. I have a, a wonderful family. I have jobs that I love. I love all of my jobs. I have colleagues that I care about. I have friends that I care about. And I just want to make sure that if anything ever came so that I'm canceled because of the book, just can you support me through that? Because I, I will, it will make me anxious. My whole goal is to put something out there in the world that's going to help and make people happy and be something that's a good force in the world. But if I'm garnering a lot of criticism, that's like the exact opposite thing that I want. And, and she recognizes the importance of that. So you're happening upon something that I even talked about with the book publicist. And one book publicist shared with me that she has fiction writers who have been attacked because, for example, a character that they wrote about was not actually representing, you know, an 18th century woman as the 18th century woman should have been represented or something like that. Right. And, and the woman and the person who wrote the book was like, well, I was never an 18th century woman. I think that was clear <laughs> when I wrote the book. Um, and, and yes, of course, it's not going to be historically accurate or, you know, perfect. But then this author got scared then of writing more. So it could dampen your creative well. It, that kind of criticism can make you scared to move forward. And so... It's, it is hard. It's really hard. And I think about these kids. One thing I could tell you by raising teenagers is this. Though. When I look at my 13-year-old, he is so kind of habituated to cancel culture that he brushes it off. He's like, you're going to get famous. You're going to get canceled. That's it. Famous canceled, famous canceled. You just yeah. read. And so the reinvention doesn't have to take a year of you like doing whatever you did in not another teen movie. <laughs> the reinvention can happen the next day with a new post. Right. So although cancel culture is so prominent that he's habituated to it, it also, I think, makes him really have all of these criticisms just roll off his shoulders. He really just doesn't care. Oh, well, people are, you're going to write a book. Of course, people are going to say bad things about you. You know, that's the price of fame, according yeah. to him. So I'm going to probably have to keep my 13 year old's views in mind as I, you know, embark upon this next phase of my career where I am really kind of opening myself. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I love to hear that because one of my favorite types of guests to have on the show, I've had a bunch of professors who have faced not just criticism because criticism is kind of normal and expected, but, but cancellation for having whatever unpopular views or even just saying one unpopular thing. <laughs> And there's countless stories of this happening to professors on campus. And oh yeah, a, a lot of them, the guests I have on, they say that I just have to accept that I'm, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to stand up for what I'm saying, stand up for my work and whatever comes, comes. And I think the more people that take that position, the more, the less you're going to see these cancellations because they're going to realize that you don't win by, by doing that. And so I love, I love that that younger generation is kind of seeing that and just accepting that that's a part of, the world now and it, it's not a big deal yeah i hope I, I mean yeah actually what you just said actually makes me feel a lot better that there are other people who are feeling the same way as i do and they're like this is what i believe and it's not only what i believe it's what i've been studying right. you know it's this isn't just a book of my beliefs <laughs> this is a book of science integrated with experiences that i think is really valuable for the world and i will not waver on that position so thank you for reinforcing that for me you're welcome so let's get back to to the dating stuff because this is the so selfishly, what I'm most interested in. in oh, good. Point. Okay, let's so, hear it. So you bring up this idea of backburners. You say a lot of people have people who are in relationships have backburner relationships of, of people yeah. that they're connected with on social media who they could possibly see replacing their current relationship if if something doesn't work out. That it, it's it's not a foreign idea to me because I, I've heard this idea before, but it's something that to me like doesn't make sense naturally because when I'm in a relationship, I feel like. I feel relieved that I don't have to think about <laughs> looking for someone. I, so I, I like I, I'm the the back burner thing just causes me stress. That idea of it. So <laughs> what do you have a, an idea of like what percentage of people are are back burner people versus people more like me who who want nothing to do with that? 
I mean, yeah, I, 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 I don't know the exact statistics, but I think more than half of our student, our college students who we um, asked about had at least one back burner and the, the adults that we talked to too had back burners. But I think when you think about a back burner, you don't have to think about it as some kind of relationship that you're maintaining off outside of your main relationship. Instead, it could be someone you talk to only occasionally who you'd be interested in pursuing a relationship with if things were to fail, right? So, or maybe not even if things were to fail, maybe in addition to your relationship. The point is, it doesn't have to be a relationship that you invest a lot of time in or the normal relationship maintenance strategies that we enact when we have a relationship are not necessarily applicable here. It could be a friend. It could be a person from your past who you just, you know, talk to once every three or four months. <clears throat> On average, people keep in touch with their back burners about once a month. So it's not super in depth. And I think if you broaden kind of your view of back burner relationships, it's just those people who sparked enough interest in you that you think, hmm, maybe something could happen with that person one day. And then you just talk to them. Again, it could be 100% platonic. So the amount of stress that you think you might experience, you might actually not experience because you might not be pursuing anything. Now, some people do have sexual back burners where they actually do talk to them in a sexual way and they think, oh, I definitely want to have sex with this person. Um, and those relationships might be a little more stress inducing for the people who have them. But yeah, the, in terms of the simple prevalence, more than half of people have back burners. And, and again, is that something that I'm sure with technology, it's become easier to maintain those kind of relationships. So I assume that also has led, has it led to a, a rise in jealousy? I mean, how do people, when, when, when you introduce this idea of, of back burner to someone, how can they not start thinking, well, is, is the person I'm dating, do they have back burners? How serious are those back burners? What do, do people kind of start to spiral when you start introducing that idea? So that that's actually a really good research study. Like <laughs> we haven't done that research yet. And maybe actually that's the next phase. I'm Jason Dibble is the main person do, who I do this back burner research with. And he's phenomenal. He's amazing. He's a Jack of all trades. So he, um, <clears throat> if you don't know, so he's a professor of communication and, at Hope college in Michigan. And he DJs sometimes on Saturdays and he is a high school football referee and just was able to do high school refing for a big state game. So he is just like amazing and always, um, I, I adore him in any case, his, when we think about backburners, we have a bunch of studies that we're thinking of, but this is actually really a great idea as something to look forward. Let's introduce the concept of a backburner to you. And then how stressful does that make, how stressed does that make you feel about your own relationship? Right. Um, that would be a really easy experiment to do. I love it. You're contributing to science right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Give me a PhD <laughs> now. I, I'm, I'm also going to contribute to a bunch of guys going crazy because I'm, I'm I guess, I, like, as I'm reading this stuff, I'm like, wow, I, I wonder if I've been with someone who's been doing, like, it, it, it does make your brain start thinking about it. Maybe again, it's just me. Maybe I'm nuts, but, uh. But no, I mean, don't say nuts, but I would say, have you been with someone who's done this? Yes. I mean, right. both chances are you have. <laughs> so I'm sorry to break it to you if that was something that you didn't, <laughs> didn't want. I no, I, like you said, it's, I, everyone kind of does it, or a lot of people do it in some context or another. So it's, it's, it's not always nefarious. Exactly. You, you had this one sentence in the book and you didn't, you really didn't go into any detail on it, but you mentioned that more people today are okay with the idea of affairs than they used to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't sure what you meant by that. Like, is it the actual kind of the idea of the affair of, of someone sneaking around with someone else outside of the relationship? Is that what you mean? Is that the definition of affair? And yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. Some kind of sexual relationship outside of your primary relationship. So uh, the research shows that although a long, I can't remember what the dates are, you probably know better because it's fresher, but you know, a while ago when they asked the question, is this always wrong, sometimes wrong, people were more likely to say it was always wrong. Today, they're like, yeah, it's only sometimes wrong. Now, I'm not going to say that necessarily that reflects people tolerating more infidelity in relationships. Not necessarily. What I think people are more attuned to now are things like polyamory, the idea that people can have multiple 
you know, sexual experiences with other individuals and still be devoted to that individual. So I think the conceptualization of stepping out on your relationship has gotten a little bit defined a little bit differently as time has gone on. So I think partially it's a reflection of that. And it could be, as you say, a reflection as well of just people recognizing, ah, this happens a lot. And social media is really facilitating it. And tech in general, being able to like covertly message people is probably facilitating these interactions so not it's not necessarily when you say the word affair it's not necessarily surreptitiously people aren't more accepting of someone sneaking around but they're just more okay with something that's more than the non-traditional relationship um i mean the the question was posed as an affair so it really depends how they those researchers define affair and i without having a study in front of me i can't tell but the definition probably was defined to them but i'm guessing that people's more liberal views about relationship constructions overall will factor as well into even if they're in a traditional relationship. My just my world being open to these ideas of polyamory and these other ideas of alternate relationship structures, friends of benefits, and things like that may make me a little bit more tolerant of my spouse having an affair. Right. Everyone I've talked to who's used dating apps, even people I know, several couples who've gotten married after meeting on dating apps, everyone, everyone complains about them. Though everyone says how miserable the experience was. Even the people who got married said, "I was about to delete it before I met this person." Oh wow! So the fact that you're you're surprised by that, has your experience talking with people about it been different? And my other question is, I, I always try to place this historically. I mean, I feel like everyone's always complained about the process of dating. Is is that anything new now that we have apps? Yeah. I mean, the process of dating is hard. You're trying to find the one or, you know, the ones depending on your relationship configuration. Um, but I think dating has always been hard. And let's go back to what I said before, melding two lives of people who are different, I think is a hard thing. But I think the complications that the internet brings are many. One, when you meet someone in real life, you get a sense of what your chemistry is like. You can actually see what they look like. One of the things that I hear a lot of people who are online dating say is that they meet someone and their picture does not match what they put online, right? And so automatically that chemistry, that physical chemistry, that is a very good thing that people want in relationships, it's not there. So they might have taken a lot of time talking to a person that they actually don't have any physical chemistry with. And that's an opportunity cost. It's an opportunity cost for other things in their life, you know, things that they could do for work or spending time with their moms or whatever. But it's also an opportunity cost for them pursuing other relationships. So I can see how it's a really frustrating experience. Not only that, what I've talked about with online dating is just the sheer number of decisions you have to make all the time in order to be online dating. How many people am I going to talk to? What am I going to say when I message back? How how soon should we meet? If we meet, how soon would we get intimate? Am I willing to manage multiple people talking on top? at one time? Am I willing to be meeting multiple people at one time? Like all of those things that you're having to decide upon really complicates what is already a complicated venture, right? So yeah, I I think it's really tough and I can understand where the complaints lie. I think that what people fail to consider is exactly, as I say, what I outline in my book, just how many decisions you have to make all the time. And making decisions is hard. Like it's cognitively challenging to make decisions. And you might think, oh, and when you see, okay, I have 26 new messages, which ones do I reply to? What do I say to the ones I reply to? I'm also talking to, you know, this guy, Ben, and Ben and I went on one date. And do I have to end things with Ben and tell him before I talk to this, you know, whatever. Like it's just a lot, a lot of decision making. And we already have complicated lives that are keeping us very busy. So I can see, I can see. And how much of it is, I wonder, have you looked into arranged marriages and kind of the long-term outcomes of people in societies with arranged marriages versus where we are today with kind of the opposite of it, where we have just unlimited choices and what's, how does, how does, how do those societies compare to ours in terms of satisfaction long-term? Do you have any insight into that? I don't. That's a really great question. Yeah. Why would you, would you opt for that? I, at this <laughs> point, at this point, my, my dad actually has a funny story. When he was in college, he went, went to Italy and he was actually, I think in the town where my family's from and they actually tried to arrange a marriage. They tried to set him up with someone in the town while he was there just for a couple of months. 
because that, oh, wow. that was kind of the tradition around there was was these arranged yeah. marriages and, and yeah was, where what was the town uh, uh monte corvino i think is the name of the town uh, it's in that's southern big... italy and and that's just kind of typical i think i, I don't know if they still do it now that was 50, 40 or so years ago but it seems like that, that at least takes away all the the stress of having to, to make this decision and, and am I making the right thing and am I looking at this and that and just having someone say, you know what, I know you, I know this person, I'm putting you together and you'll have to just figure out how to make it work. Because in some, I felt in my own life outside of dating, I felt like t- at times when decisions have kind of been forced upon me and I just have to accept them, in some ways I'm happier that way because I just, I say, this is the situation I'm in and I'm just going to learn how to accept it as opposed to when I have a million options in front of me, even when I pick one option, I think, well, should I pick that other option? Do I still have the chance to switch? Do I? So I, 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 don't, I don't know. I like the idea of choice, obviously. I, I'm an American through and through. I, I like freedom of, of options and opportunity, but there are some benefits I see to just saying, hey, this is the situation you're in. You're reminding me, although, you know, to make it this simple is far more simple than it is. Yeah. But so I, I now when I go to restaurants, um, where I where I usually am not so restaurants that I don't know, um, always when I travel for work, instead of ordering something, I just tell the server, just bring me whatever you think I'd like, whatever, whatever you want. And um, it, it, I, I always love it. I make so many decisions in my daily life. It is really, really nice to have someone make a decision for me. And I feel like who knows better about the food in this restaurant than you who is serving it to lots of people. You see what they order. You see what they like. You see people like me. You see what they like. And I, I've tried things I've never, I would have never picked from the menu. I've been disappointed only once. I was recently in Hawaii. And we were eating at a place called the Lanai and it was right on the water outside and everyone was ordering salads. And I just said to the the server, I said, bring me anything you'd like. I said, all I'm asking, and I don't usually make any provisions, but all I'm asking is that it's something light. It was warm. And she's like, okay, no problem. So she went away and everyone's getting served and they're like, who had the fish and chips? I'm like, I guess that's me, (laughs) fish and chips. And it was this huge plate of French fries and the most battered fish I'd ever seen in my lifetime. And I was like, we really have different definitions of light. But I loved it because it just was, it was just interesting. Like, (laughs) so like you, when I've had decisions made for me, it's actually, a, you know, a good part of my life. That said, I really believe strongly that we have natural attractions based on our own biology, not only things like our pheromones, but our, ge- our genes. So you are drawn to people, and you might remember this from the book, but you are drawn to people who are genetically similar to you. And when you actively choose your friends, your mates, um, some of that might be your biology driving you towards those people. So to have someone else choose it would mean that those natural biological urges that you would have are kind of dismissed. So uh, I not, I don't know the data, but I, I would say I really like the power of choice that we have, even though it does come with a lot of cognitive burden. Right. I know. Ultimately, I, I think I'm with you. <laughs> I want to get to what I think was, this is the most interesting part of the book. This is the part that like like took me on oh. a roller coaster because it, this idea of, uh, are men intimidated by highly educated women? This, this is a debate I've had so many times. And as soon as I saw you write this, I was like, okay, here we go. Because for me, I, I have friends across the spectrum of, of education. I have friends who are blue collar guys. I have friends who are, who are lawyers and, and PhDs. I've never talked to a guy who has said, oh, I was really into this girl, but you know, she was just too smart for me. So that, that to me is where I, I came into this discussion. And, I, and so at first I was like, I thought you were going to pick the other side. Then I saw you, you report some, some, some findings that said men didn't care about a potential partner's income and education, but women did, which that, that aligns kind of with, again, my own just anecdotal experience. But then you got into this idea, you, you kind of just ran this informal experiment with some people you knew that you, you said, you, you told this group of guys, you said, okay, you've got two profiles of two different women. They're, all the profiles are exactly the same. All the, everything about them is exactly the same, except one woman's a cheerleader and one is an astronaut. And you asked them, which one would you pick? And they all went with the cheerleader. And when I kind of did this experiment myself in my own head, I thought, you know what? I, I, didn't, think, I didn't think it would matter to me. Like, like if, if I was thinking of it very quickly, I'd say, oh yeah, I'll pick the astronaut. But when I really sat down and thought about it, I thought, 
I think I would actually pick the cheerleader. So it was very, you really made me kind of go against my own. Yeah, good. I'm glad. I, I don't you know, know if here's a good the, thing or not, but no, no. I think it's good. Here's the thing. You know, what I say in my book, I want to make it very clear. Both cheerleaders and astronauts, I hold a high place for, and both of them are doing something that I cannot do. You know, but one of them implies um, a, a sense of ambition. Very few people in this world are astronauts, right? So the people who get there are like the pinnacle of um, like physical strength. They have to do all of these very challenging physical things. They also have to um, be really smart. You know, they have to have, I think at least a master's degree. Anyway, I, I outline it all in the book. So they're, they're usually incredibly ambitious. I, and I can't remember, but like less than 50 people in the United States are astronauts. It's it just, it's hard, but they also go on these intergalactic adventures. Right. Um, what was interesting to me when I asked people about it and you're right, it was informal experiment, just asking, um, various men that I knew what was interesting to me was the reason that most of them cited. And about the astronaut, uh, astronaut, they said too much ambition. But what I think they're missing out to is I think everyone would like to have a cheerleader in their lives. You know, someone who is going to be upbeat and happy and supportive and not necessarily that all cheerleaders are that way, but someone who has had that experience, maybe there are some positive things about that, that someone looks at and thinks, Hey, as a partner, that's actually really appealing to me. Someone who's going to be my cheerleader, right? To have a cheerleader in your life would be valuable. So I really don't cover that in the book, but I think that's an important part. That said, um, I think there's not only maybe a move towards a cheerleader, which might have been what you were feeling, like I want a cheerleader, that'd be great. Um, but also a movement away from from people who could be maybe highly intimidating. I think you said you're friends with all kinds of people in all kinds of world. I think astronauts are probably intimidating to all of us, right? <laughs> they have actually been to places that none of us will ever be. They are some of the most unique in terms of number people in the world. So I think um, it's kind of an extreme example, but it's interesting that you did your own mental experiment. What I challenge you to do is to ask other people, you know, to continue my experiment and see what they say because, and then return to me with the results so I can uh, use it when I'm on my book tour. No, <laughs> I, can, no. I can say, hey, you know what? There are other people who are also looking into this for me. So I'd love to hear. We'll talk about my rates for being your research assistant off air. <laughs> Most of my research assistants do it for free. So just FYI, there's not a big pot of money. Um, but anyway, just 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 to let the listeners know. Some of us are more qualified than others. So that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so I actually the initial reason I wanted to talk to you was I, I'm always interested when I, I kind of see something anecdotally and I, I look up kind of just to see if there's any research on it that backs it up and it, it backs it up. So I've noticed when I talk to younger guys, you know, guys in their early twenties, it's mostly guys that, that I know from the gym. So they're, they're healthy, fit guys. And I talk to them about relationships and about girls. And when I was that age, and that was only like a decade ago, but when I was that age, that's literally all we wanted to talk about. It's all we could talk about. And when I talk to younger guys now, they're just, it's not even that they're uncomfortable talking about it. It's that they have such less interest, it seems in relationships and just just women in general than than we did a decade ago and and now it's, there's a lot of research out there now that's showing that the you know the rates of sex for younger people are dropping precipitously which i guess a lot of people would probably say is is a good thing there's probably less unwanted pregnancies and and that sort of thing but and it's the same you know you, you see the same numbers even with drinking that that kids are drinking less which again yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of good obviously to that but I, to me, it feels like there's a there's a deeper issue. There's a deeper social connection issue when when you see those kind of steep drop offs. Uh, can can you talk about that? Like why why are we seeing this specifically with with younger people? Because I think again, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the numbers are are kind of dropping for everyone, but they're most precipitous with with younger people. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. This was definitely something I highlighted in one of my chapters. So, you know, the rates, they're saying that millennials are having less sex than their parents did at the same age. So um, as you get older, sex rates drop. But among the young adults, when we look at them historically, they are not having as much sex as they did before. And you brought up all the reasons why this might be beneficial, right? Unwanted pregnancy, um, 
STIs, you know, down. But yeah, what I'm concerned about, and I think it's a real concern, is maybe they're not forming intimate enough relationships that sex is occurring, right? If I just, let's say I'm a person who's using a dating app and I, I don't want to make dating apps a scapegoat for anything, but let's say I'm using a dating app and I am going on dates. None of them are really working out. And I keep searching, searching, searching. Well, that is taking the time of what may have happened before, which is there was a girl in my class and I talked to her and she said we, she would go out and I just persisted with it. Maybe we weren't a hundred percent perfect with each other, but I thought, well, I'm going to be, I'll be willing to take her out again. Cause there's no one else really that I'm, I'm pursuing. So I'm going to pursue her again. I'm going to pursue her again. And then maybe after a couple of months of seeing her, we have an intimate relationship, right? But the point is maybe I'm getting deep with that person who I met in my class because I didn't have a lot of other options that I was pursuing that were, again, an opportunity cost for me getting close with one. So I do think it's a trend that we need to be mindful of as we head into this new world and look at whether or not it's having an effect on the depth of relationships, the amount of intimacy people feel in the relationships, and certainly the amount of commitment they feel in relationships. And I'm not saying that there is some right structure. You know, I'm very lenient in the idea that as human beings, we have a power to shape our own future. We do not have to cling to things that didn't work so or don't work. So maybe the, the right answer isn't to have deep relationships that lead to sex. Maybe. But sex is good for the body, which I think you always also read in my book. So, um, and it provided you have people who are consenting adults um, there, and you know who are practicing the safe sex, so that people are not injured in it. Um, I think that there are a lot of benefits to just society for people engaging in those kinds of relationships. Have you gotten any interest from people? Because apart from even just the the interpersonal issues and and just the personal happiness issues. There's there's like these bigger societal, even economic issues with the, the fact that our repl replacement rate is below what we need for future generations to be able to support older generations. Have there been anyone who's kind of in a position of, of policy making who's who's expressed an interest in your work? Not yet. I mean, the. The, I think the book will get us talking about some of those things because, yeah, we, we happen upon them. Um, there, You know, when that study came out about millennials having less sex, I don't feel like it was celebrated. I don't feel like there was anyone from public health who was saying, this is a great thing. I think people who were talking to me about it, and that was a couple of years ago now, and the trends have just remained the same. All the people who talked to me about it were slightly concerned, but they just didn't know why, why we should we be concerned. But I think we really need to have some deeper conversations about why this is happening and what this means for the future of humanity. And I would love to take part in those yeah. conversations. Well, we're running out of time, but I have one more question. I want to end on a positive note because this is one of my favorite stats that you, that you cite in the book. You said that more than half of airline passengers strike up a conversation with someone sitting near them. And you said 14 to 16 percent have made a close relationship or business connection. I love when I'm on an airplane to the consternation of a lot of people I travel with. I love <laughs> talking to whoever I'm sitting next to because it's someone who's going somewhere, someone who has something to do. It's always someone interesting. How do we get more people to, to be open to that? Because I, I think, again, it's just those basic social interactions that might seem uncomfortable to a lot of people, people especially people who are a little more introverted. I think that can help foster such, such beneficial connections for people. Yeah. So, okay. This is what I would say. One, there's value to you in talking to strangers. It increases your ability to resonate with humanity. Okay. So just dismiss the belief that there's no value to you. There, there have been plenty of studies that have been conducted that says, that say that there's value. Um, and even if you think you're personally different than the people in those studies, I would still say open, you know, expand yourself a little bit. But the second thing I think is that we have to realize that it's not just about us. The person who's sitting next to us might really need to talk. People who are traveling on an airplane are traveling for a variety of reasons. Somebody might be going to see someone who's sick. Someone might be um, going to adopt a child. Who knows? But connecting with them can never be seen as a bad thing, right? Allowing yourself to be open to a connection with another human being is also allowing them the feeling of this person wants to be connected to me. So I think you are ending with, I think, the most positive note. And if I could say there is a theme that I want resonating throughout the book, which is 
you know, let's try to be connected to other people and open ourselves as much as we can to the social possibilities in our world that will make us all feel like a little less lonely and a little happier. Yeah, well, I think that is the perfect place to end. Dr. Michelle Druin, I got through maybe 10% of the questions I wanted to ask you. That's how great the book is. The book is Out of Touch, How to Survive an Intimacy Famine. You can order it, uh, pre-order it now on Amazon. I'll include the link in the show notes. Uh, it'll be out February 1st. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much. It was great to speak with you today. And where else can people find you? Uh, on Instagram at Dr. Michelle Druin, on Twitter at Dr. M. Druin. Either one of those places will be great. And I always respond to direct messages. Great. Great. Well, again, thank you so much. I'll try to promote the book as much as I can. I think it's good for everyone. Thank you. I appreciate it.